Hola, comrades. I have an obituary to read. E3 passed away at midnight last night at the tender young age of 22, leaving behind a diverse and complex legacy through multiple eras. She will be remembered for her ambition, her spirit, and her fiery heart that helped guide the industry through its massive growth and development throughout these last two decades. No, she was not perfect, as evidenced by her disastrous mistakes in 2007 and 2008, as well as some of her most groan-inducing moments, such as Sony's 2007 six conference, but she will be remembered fondly despite her failure to innovate and keep up with the times because of the great games she showcased to the world, the great experiences she gave to people of all ages throughout the years. May she rest in peace. Okay, okay, E3 isn't dead yet, but it is dying. Started in May 1995 in Los Angeles, E3 was a revolution. The 90s were a difficult time for video games. As graphics advanced and storytelling became more complex, the gaming industry was butting up against the space set out for it as merely an impertinent children's toy. There were those absurd scandals about video games brainwashing our youths and the moral outrage at the pixels of blood shown in games such as Mortal Kombat. If you're younger, you might think I'm making some of this up, but I assure you I am not. Compared to older art forms, gaming was the new kid on the block, which meant it got the most punishment. This extended to the treatment it received at CES, the Consumer Electronics Show. This is a name likely to be familiar with the tech geeks among you, but for the uninvolved it is basically a long-running expo where companies show off the latest and greatest in tech, from TVs to PCs to phones. Video games got treated like a red-headed stepchild there, as business magnate and then CEO of Sony Americas, Tom Kalinske, said, CES organizers used to put the video games industry way, way in the back. In 1991, they put us in a tent and you had to walk past all the porn vendors to find us. That particular year, it was pouring rain and the rain leaked right over our new Genesis system. I was just furious with the way CES treated the video games industry, and I felt we were a more important industry than they were giving us credit for. In the mid-1990s, Pat Farrell, the creator of GamePro magazine, pursued the idea of an expo dedicated solely to video games, and contacted what was then known as IDGA, which was formed as a response to the controversies the gaming industry faced over its so-called scandalous sex and violence. You know the ESRB? Yeah, that's how that came to be. The case over the sex and violence was actually taken to Congress in 1994, where a reactionary prudishness spearheaded by the perennially terrible Joe Lieberman forced the industry to scramble and come up with some sort of rating system. That's a whole other story, though. So there is this industry body for gaming, the IDGA, and Pharrell went to them with his idea, and they were interested, offering to co-fund this event with IDG, the publisher of GamePro, and so the Electronic Entertainment Expo, what we call E3, was born. This was a bolt of lightning for the industry. Because of the unique interactivity of games compared to other art forms, an expo was an exceptional chance for developers to show off their wares on a grand stage. Because of this, and because gaming award shows aren't as important as movie or TV award shows because they are less centralized, E3 has been the biggest event on the gaming calendar basically since its inception. But there's no question that the show just doesn't feel as big anymore. Quick, what are the biggest E3 moments you can think of? What comes to mind? Awe-inspiring presentations? The shock of seeing an unexpected game? No, I bet what you think of are the flubs, like this. Wow. One million troops. I love you guys. Or like this. It requires huge financial investment, 599 US dollars, but we must take risks to reap the rewards. E3 is more exciting than, say, the Oscars, because of merely watching rich people give other rich people little golden statues, you get new information on games you're excited for, or entirely new games. The one purely positive E3 moment I can vividly remember in the past five years or so was the announcement of the Final Fantasy VII Remake. That was lucid. But for the most part, seeing new information on games, or worse, old information they had already heard, does not stick in people's minds, while flubs like this... It's Ridge Racer! Ridge Racer! ...do. 
Okay, you say, that may be true, but why is E3 declining now? Surely there have been flubs for forever. To which I say, yes, but there have been substantially more recently. And then you say, fine, but the flubs aren't the big concern. People remembering them instead of the actual show is a byproduct of the show not catching people's eyes. So how has the show grown less interesting over time? So much so that it has contributed to the decline of the entire expo. And to that I say, you're an intelligent fellow, aren't you? I'm glad you've been paying attention. Well, there are two developments that we must discuss. The first is the disastrous misstep IDGA, now known as ESA, made after 2006. In the face of rising costs of presenting at E3 as well as pressure from large vendors, there was a restructuring, or as I'd like to call it, a decapitation. Firstly, the event was renamed from the Electronic Entertainment Expo to the much more boring E3 Business and Media Summit. I mean, ick. That sounds like some training your business makes you attend. More substantially, attendees not considered to be industry professionals were barred from attending, and the event was moved from the LA Convention Center to a hangar in the Santa Monica Airport. The words they used to describe this were cringeworthy. This wasn't a downsizing, they simply wanted a more focused environment, a more intimate atmosphere. Ugh. These sound like the worst euphemisms of a boss who's before he fires half the employees at his company. Realizing that having the convention in an airport hangar was a bad idea, they moved it back to the LA Convention Center in 2008, but attendance was limited to 5,000 people, this in comparison to the 50,000 who attended the 2016 Expo and the 70,000 who attended the event at its peak. 5,000. That's pitiful. E3 was reduced from the biggest event in gaming to this purposeless, pitiful affair that damaged the chances of indie developers to get their product seen and hurt E3's reputation as a whole. No one liked what had become of E3. With no one attending, there was no buzz for games, no excitement. There was little reason for even showcasing your games, and the expo faced a choice. Return to the good old days, or roll over and die. They chose to live, but that was the closest the expo came to actually ceasing to be. When 2009's E3 was as big and bombastic as those that had come before, everyone was so happy that the event had been saved that they didn't realize the permanent damage that had been done. E3 would never again be as big as it was. The two years of those lifeless expos, 2007 and 2008, sent the event on a slow but steady decline that continues to this day. The gaming landscape changed significantly between 2006 and 2009, with those two lackluster business and media summits. They effectively sat out two of the most important years in gaming. 2007 was the year of Super Mario Galaxy and Bioshock and Mass Effect. Pokemon Diamond and Pearl were released worldwide this year. This was the first full year of release for the Wii and the PS3. I consider this to be a critical year in gaming. There are three distinct eras in gaming. The first is the early days, before the release of the NES and the decline of arcades. The second is the era of massive innovation, which lasted about 20 years, through the 90s and most of the 2000s. The third era, the modern era, the one we're in right now, started in 2007. 2008 was only scarcely less important. This was the year of Grand Theft Auto 4 and Mario Kart Wii and Super Smash Bros. Brawl. I might be over-exaggerating the importance of these years because of my personal connection with them. After all, they were the first years I really started getting into gaming, but I don't think so. Because the second major development we need to discuss is the rise of the role the internet played in gaming and gaming culture. Ever since the advent of the World Wide Web, tips and tricks about gaming have been traded back and forth. Blurry screenshots were shared that you couldn't be sure were real. If you didn't know where to go, you could jump on game FAQs and try to find a walkthrough. But then, everything changed. Gaming crept further into the mainstream at the same time that internet use was skyrocketing. In 2008, Apple released the iPhone and the world was forever changed. Smartphones popped up in people's pockets. 
They didn't need to be at home to have easy, intuitive access to the web, but for gaming and E3, it's hard to think of a more important development than that of YouTube. Though YouTube launched in 2005, it came into its own during these two years. Its growth was lightning fast. By July of 06, it was delivering over 100 million video views per day, and it was the fifth most visited website in the world. This was a big reason why Sony's press conference in 06 was such a disaster, and it indeed was so much a disaster. It requires a huge financial investment, 599 US dollars, but we must take risks to reap the rewards. I never get sick of that. Everyone could see these clips and play them as often as they wanted. There was a lot of strange and experimental content on YouTube in those days, but what was most striking about it was how young it skewed. The 12 to 17 age group was flocking to the site, leaving behind television and traditional media. This didn't worry the TV networks much at first, but as that age group grew up and began cutting into the prized 18 to 54 demographic, the decline in ratings the networks were already suffering through precipitated. But that's another story. This story is more concerned with the behavior of that original, young demographic that clung onto YouTube. What were they interested in? Animation, for one, which is why when I look up content for Avatar The Last Airbender, a lot of the results I get are from the mid-2000s. For another is, as I'm sure you've guessed, gaming. YouTube added a layer of, I don't want to call it clarity or sophistication, but it was definitely a layer of growth to the chaotic, subterranean gaming communities on the internet. There was less guesswork, less difficulty, there was a clarity that wasn't there before, an added element of interactivity. You could make friends or enemies, and if you met some annoying gits that you didn't like, it was easier to get away from them without disrupting your overall experience. False claims were more easily debunked, and communities were linked together into something larger. What was best was the unity. You didn't need to visit your five different forums, everything was right there. I don't think it's any coincidence that the rise of YouTube coincided with the gradual decline of a lot of websites dedicated to particular franchises. If you are a Pokemon fan, you didn't need to scrounge around for the latest Poke tips. You could go on YouTube. Everything was there. The branches of these gaming communities were integrated, and these communities were integrated with each other. And as this revolution took place, E3 held these rinky-dink, nonsense, thoroughly pointless business and media summits. You have this insurgent platform for spreading information, rising at a breathless pace, and you have the industry standard for conveying information, closing itself off from outsiders, what could go wrong? The result is that by the time E3 was revived to its true state in 2009, it was not as essential. Obviously, YouTube and the insurgent internet could not create real information, but they could convey it everywhere at once. And what is the purpose of E3? To convey information on a grand scale, to get everyone excited and involved. The major platform provided is why game developers reveal their new information at E3 instead of some other time in the year, but with information spreading like wildfire, thanks to YouTube and, more generally, the internet, the advantage of presenting at E3 had diminished. Perhaps this was bound to occur eventually, but by holding these two lifeless shows at a time when YouTube was exploding, the change was hastened. Already by 2009, it had lost its gleaming place in the sun. And with the rise of Twitter, a platform where messages could be shared almost instantly, its further decline was inevitable. You didn't need to pay attention to E3 to get the news on the biggest games. You could get that information from someone else. Behind the facade of monumental importance, E3 was nothing more than bits of info being conveyed. A presenter could talk for 20 minutes about the importance of a franchise, but all the audience is going to care about is the release date of the newest title. Like was the case with the ward shows, E3 was forced into a sort of irrelevance with the advancement of these communicative networks, but it was not dead. Millions of people watch the Oscars and Grammys every year, even though they could just as easily not watch the shows and get the list of winners the next day. And this is for the same reason people watch Game of Thrones instead of just reading recaps of it the next day. It's not just about what happens, it's about why, and it's about how. In short, it's about the presentation. This is why those comedy routines, as well as the overall vibe of glitz and glam, are so important to the Oscars. And this is why the Grammys pride themselves on these live performances that make the show about two hours longer than it has a right to be. 
Give the people something appealing beyond basic bits of information, and they'll still watch. E3 has not been able to do this. Partially, this is because gaming skews younger than movies and TV shows, and younger folk, partly because they're too inexperienced to care about anything more than basic facts, and partly because they're too sharp and modern to stand around listening to bad live performances and uneven comedy bits that often pretend to be of far higher importance than they actually are. But a large part of E3's growing irrelevance, even compared to award shows, is due to the structure of the show itself. There's no veneer of classiness, no suits and champagne, and they shouldn't go for that. That would not be conducive with the spirit of gaming. But they do need to go for something, and it needs to be something specific to the medium. What is the essence of E3? That question needs to be answered, and currently it can't be. In the old days, simply having an expo for gaming was enough, and I won't deny that the growth of gaming in the 90s and 2000s is tied to E3, but if the convention does not change, it will slide from merely humorously irrelevant to thoroughly obsolete. Gaming does not need E3 anymore, and that's the problem. What would this new E3 look like? I think Nintendo has the best path forward. Despite its infamous lack of foresight on some topics, when the big N is on, it's brilliant. Starting in 2013, it got rid of the traditional conferences with the presenter. This is such a relief. Those conferences are boring, anemic, and occasionally cringeworthy. Instead, Nintendo uses these pre-recorded Nintendo Direct events to get the information out there in a clean, fresh way that is easily satiable for mass consumption online. They also make E3 into more of a gameplay-focused experience. There are the Nintendo Treehouse events where new games are live-streamed. They did a very good job of this with Breath of the Wild at the last E3, helping build this monumental hype. Also, and this isn't just a Nintendo thing, but they do it best, games are available to play, which is important. The interactivity component is what allows gaming to stand out. Instead of having to take a presenter's word for it, attendees can play games themselves, and a lot of these important journalists and YouTubers convey their experience of playing. And if that experience is positive, E3 can have a greater impact than mere bits of news in terms of building excitement. It becomes that it's not only facts that are being transferred from E3, but also experiences. Nintendo is the best at this because they create the best environment for these play sessions. One that helps players get more immersed in the games and have a more positive experience overall, which means a more positive experience to take home and convey to their audiences. I'm not saying other companies should straight copy Nintendo, though they're no strangers to this as evidenced by everyone's desperate attempts to copy the Wii in the late 2000s and early 2010s, most notably and egregiously Microsoft's Kinect for the Xbox 360 and Xbox One, which contributed little to the world besides this hilarious fail of a presentation at E3 2010. There you are. Skittles? Hi. Okay, get down now. Skills, be careful. You're okay? I'm good. <laughs> You're my good skills. Yes, you are. But they should definitely take inspiration, or else risk having their E3 presentations amount to meaningless natter and bringing the entire convention down with them. And if nothing changes, at least we will have clips like this to comfort us from now to when the entire expo goes belly up. It requires a huge financial investment, 599 US dollars, but we must take risks to reap the rewards. We will see what we will see. By the time this is uploaded, the 2017 E3 will be right around the corner. I can't wait to see the new games. Despite its decline through the last 10 years, it is still the biggest event in gaming. Pretty soon there will be more news and speculation racing through the air, and I will be ready and willing to make analyses on all the great new games. So if you liked what you saw today, consider donating to my Patreon so I can produce more amazing content. Also, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, all that incredible stuff. Adios, comrades!